Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. And so we've been travelling. I've been, I've flown in from Palm Beach this morning just to do this uh, podcast. Uh, and then I'm off to Sri Lanka tomorrow to, to talk about the Mount Battens. But today we're talking about something that someone's asked us to look at, and that's uh, whether George VI had a mistress or two, oh, uh, which everyone finds very hard to believe. But we are going to talk to someone later who may shed some light on that. And I think you would like me to... I did a bit of research, and I think I've got a few little leads myself on George VI. Goodness but all, me. Well, they yeah. had affairs, so it's nothing new. Yeah, welcome, everybody, to our most outrageously, scandalously gossipy episode yet. <laughs> Expect so innuendos, half-truths, and unprovable allegations. Such fun. Yes, yes. Well, then we're, we're, we're going where no other royal biographer has gone before. Um, but, I mean, there's, I, someone today was telling me that they thought that uh, Anthony Blunt was George V's illegitimate son. I don't think there's any truth in that. Uh, and someone was, uh, in fact, trying to get me to research uh, that uh, George, that the Queen Mum uh, um, gave birth to Princess Margaret, but had an affair with Victor Sassoon, who was a Jewish businessman. And that was her real father. So uh, I'm afraid that one hasn't got, got any legs either. Yeah, the, the the whole thing with you know who was Harry's father was it James Hewitt? This this is as old as royalty itself. Always yeah. been these kind of scandals, and we could discuss and, later uh, wh wh whether it matters, why we're interested, whether we should be interested. But the truth is, we are interested. And yeah. Tom actually is such a great guest to take us into this area because his whole life and his family's life for many generations are really kind of. The sort of royal, professional royal hangers on, I suppose you could say. And yeah, and I mean, he's themselves. continuing to the present day in, in, as a journalist rather than a courtier. Yes. But yeah, I've, I've been struck with in all my research that, you know, certain families like the Matt Battens and others, you know, go back f three or four generations, very, very closely linked to the royals. I mean, clearly related to the royals too. But, you know, you see these private secretaries like Michael Adeen, you know, who are um, following a family tradition or the fellows. Um, and I mean, even I mean, uh, Fergie's father worked for Prince Charles. I mean, they keep they keep people very close to them. Well, this is the secret, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to have a life where who you marry and the children you bear, kind of your it's your job, it's your dynastic job. Um, so often these will be um, negotiated relationships, and then the 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 romantic, the passionate, the fun relationships. Or something that happens in parallel, and you keep it all within a very tight circle. Maybe people gossip about it, but actually nobody knows really anything for sure. Nobody really cares. Life goes on. Um, and Tom, Tom's family, as I'm sure you'll talk about, has sort of been part of that over several generations. This sort of the naughty secret side of royal life. But but it's more than just Tom, isn't it? I mean, you uh, and all the work you've done, Andrew, on um, on the Windsors. You've come across some six, some kind of harder evidence, I think, that uh, perhaps George VI was just like all the rest of them um, and got away with it. Well, I mean, I certainly, you know, the, Lady Colin Campbell, I suppose, has gone furthest um, in terms of, 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 of the biographies talking about the mistresses. Um, there have been uh, other people have alluded to it. And clearly I found mistresses when I did both the Duke of Windsor and I did the Mountbattens, and indeed illegitimate children. I talked in, in Thread of King about uh, a man called Seely, who I think, who's still alive, who I'm pretty sure is is the son of, of the Duke of Windsor. Um, and there are a number of other people I mentioned in the book, which, you know, there is some quite strong evidence to suggest they possibly were. Um, but George VI is interesting. I mean, the four names that, that are generally mentioned, uh, one is Camilla Sykes, that Tom's going to talk about, his grandmother. Another is Phil Phyllis Monk Monkman. Another is Evelyn Boulay, uh, Maureen Stanley, and then uh, Peter Townsend's uh, wife, Rosemary Townsend, and then someone called Magdalene Eldon. So Peter Townsend, who went out with Princess Margaret. Margaret. And, you know, if we remember, he was the innocent party in, in that uh, divorce. She had an affair with a man called De Laszlo. And 
Uh, it's suggesting that actually Rosemary Townsend may have had an affair after that with uh, George the Sixth. Now, um, this is this is uh, what uh, Lady Mo- uh, Lady Colin Campbell says. Um, and all these women, they're very much kind of in the tent, aren't they? They're they're real well, insiders. They fall into two categories: either they're aristocrats or they're actresses, uh, and. I mean, that's always one of the great concerns to get involved with an actress. I mean, it was always said of, of Philip, he, his his affairs were with actresses or, or aristocrats. Um, and certainly with George VI, I mean, before he got married to, to uh, the Queen Mum, Queen Elizabeth, uh, he seems to be involved with a series of actresses. He was a bit of a late developer compared to his older brother. Uh, and... Uh, one woman that's mentioned is a musical comedy star called Marjorie Gordon. Uh, there's a Getty girl called Ruby Miller. Uh, Felix, Felix, uh, Phyllis Monkman was a, a sort of star of the London theatrical world in the 1920s. She was three years older than Bertie. Uh, and according to the diaries of Cecil Beaton, uh, he lost his virginity to her in 1919. I mean, she was almost asked to step forward and, and do her duty. Uh, and she was an interesting figure. She was a sort of great friend of Ivan Novello and Noel Coward. I mean, I saw this even with Mountbatten. Mountbatten got one of his mistresses to sleep with his grandson uh, to initiate him into sex. So it's it's you know it is an extraordinary sort of world. Um, but what was interesting about Phyllis, Phyllis Monkman is that uh, according to a letter from uh, the future Edward VIII to his mistress Frida Dudley Ward. Um, George actually lost his virginity just before the end of the First World War in October 1918, when the letter talks about the deed was done, though no further details were shared. Um, But it was said that Albert remained close to Monkman, uh, sending her a birthday present every year until her death aged 84, and that on her death, a wallet was found with a picture of him inside. The other... Uh, the other woman that's often connected with him is a, an Australian called uh, Sheila Chisholm. She was the same age as him. She was married to the rather raffish Lord Loughborough, heir to the Earl of Roslyn. Uh, and she was a close friend of uh, Edward's mistress, uh, Frida Dudley Ward. So the four of them used to go out as the four Jews. Now, there's some dispute about whether there was an affair with Sheila Chisholm. There were also rumours that her sister had had a child, uh, a royal child, but I think that's there's no truth in that. But um, George V was so appalled by his son carrying on with this married woman with two children that he said that he wouldn't make him his son Duke of York if he continued seeing her. And Bertie wrote to his elder brother that she was the one and only person in this world who means anything to me, but he bowed to his father's wishes. And the biographer of Sheila Chisholm, Michael Robert Wainwright, discovered that after World War II, uh, Chisholm was taken to dine at Buckingham Palace by a diplomat called Sir Charles Hebben Johnson, who wrote in his diary how Bertie and Sheila had got to reminiscing. Sheila, seeing the Queen listening intently, added, and when you think, sir, how innocent it all was, George, red with fury, replied, innocent? I don't know what the devil you mean, he said. <laughs> So um, it is a side of, of, of royal and aristocratic life that does continue to fascinate. I was thinking about was it George Bernard Shaw was writing about the, the boring middle class morality of his time. And so this is why the royals remain popular, because they enjoy the things that the great mass of the working class also enjoy. <laughs> it's yes, a rather rude we, way of putting it, but <clears throat> he probably it meant um, I think he listed them as alcohol, fornication, horse racing, and boxing. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe boxing has, has dropped off the list in the same way. <laughs> but um, there is something in that, I think, you know. Um, yes, no, there is. I mean, I think there is a bond there. Well, this this is the the, the, the character Evelyn Lay. Um, she only died. She was born in 1900. She died in 1996. Um, and George met her in 1920 at a performance of the musical comedy The Shop Girl. And he was rather taken with her. Uh, and... In the words of the Dowager Lady Harding of Penshurst, the widow of his principal private secretary uh, and an intimate and lifelong friend of the Queen Mother, the King was rather more than a little in love with Evelyn Lay. Uh, and Lady Colin Campbell says that the same opinion was confided to me by the Queen Mother's late private secretary, Sir Martin Gilliatt, who knew Lay socially. 
of, and this is Lady Colin writing, of course, Her Majesty, the Queen Mother, has always been aware of the King's intense admiration for Boo, he told me. She found it rather touching and trusted absolutely in Boo's discretion. Lay's caution with regard to any discussion of the matter was maintained until her death in 1996. She forbade any mention of it in her ghostwritten autobiography, Boo to My Friends, published in 1958, which contains only one reference to the King. And when I showed her the proposed text of an article I wrote about her in the 1970s, which described the king's fervent admiration of her, she struck out the passage, writing in the margin, not in the Queen Mother's lifetime. In fact, this comes from uh, Michael Thornton, who's another royal biographer. Uh, and so yet despite his undoubted devotion to his wife, and it was said that Queen, the Queen Mum didn't like sex, whom he once described to their older daughter, the present queen, as the most marvellous person in the world in my eyes, there remains a startling possibility that George VI continued to carry a flame for one of Britain's most dazzling stars. Um, well, we should, have, we should have Lady Colin on again. Yes, no, no. We Tell can, us we all these things yourself. Um, but what do you really think, Andrew? I mean, you, George VI, of all of them, I suppose, had the reputation, perhaps until this podcast, of being kind of a bit boring, a little bit, you know, didn't have the sort of, Obviously, nothing like uh, Edward or or his own father. Almost, he was not he never intended to be king when he was born. Um, maybe I don't assume he has a fairly quiet sort of a life. But all this is a very different. Um, you know, he feels like a raffish man about town with lots of affairs going on. Do you buy that image of him? Uh, well, I think we haven't really got the true picture of George VI. There's just been a biography by Sally, Sally Bedell Smith, which I've been reading, but that very much is a conventional uh, picture. And time and time again, you know, we have a succession of books about members of the royal family, which more or less all say the same thing and present them as these paragons of virtue. And then someone comes along and writes something, you know, with evidence to back it that shows that isn't the case. So I think um, there's probably more to this than meets the eye. Uh, I mean, it'll be interesting to hear what Tom says about the relationship with with his grandmother. I mean, Lady Colin Campbell is well connected. And I mean, she certainly talks uh, in her book. Uh, she says, now the war was over, he turned his attention to three safely married women. I mean, that was always the key that they'd delivered, as you say, the, the heirs themselves, and they could then have fun. Um and she, she says, for her part, Elizabeth proved herself to be as indulgent of Bertie's involvement with Rosemary Townsend, Magdalen Eldon and Camilla Sykes as she had been with Boulay and Maureen Stanley. Each of these women had an interesting background. Each was stunningly good looking. Uh, and then she talks about the, the, the various characters and their background. And she says that by 1946, Bertie was flirting openly with Rosemary while Princess Margaret was making a more covert play for Peter. The sight of father and daughter behaving so... This is like a soap opera. Uh, well, like the royal family is Teaching a soap across opera. the generations. It's like... Um, well, you know, I found even the with... Beverly Hillbillies or something. And Matt Batten was passing on his mistresses to Prince Philip. I mean, they sort of, you know, they they, they sort of... It's like a sort of pet. They pass them on. Um, okay. We'll turn uh, you into an advert for the Republican movement, I think. <laughs> Uh, the sight of father and daughter behaving so flirtatiously with husband and wife under the benign and approving gaze of Queen Elizabeth was too much for people such as my father-in-law, Ian Campbell, 11th Duke of Argyll, who felt the hypocrisy was unendurable. Uh, and then she goes on, indeed, once Bertie was dead and Princess Margaret's romance with uh, Group Captain Peter Townsend became public knowledge, uh, Elizabeth would find her complacent smile wiped right off her face. Um, uh, she talks about how um, Rosemary and Peter Townsend were divorced in 1952. She married John de Laszlo, the son of the famous society portrait painter. They divorced in 1977. Uh, and she then talks about how she got to know um, uh, Rosemary Townsend, uh, who told her these things. Okay, uh, well, I mean, this is this is lifestyle of the rich and famous, isn't it? This is... Um... Yeah, well, no, most no. people jumping in and out of bed with each other. I think we should go to Tom because I think he, he get it from the horse's mouth. I think reading from her book, she's going to sue us for copyright breach. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, I'm just the warm up act for. No, well, I think Tom's got a lot to say about this and, and other things. So, so let's go to him. No, let's do okay. that. More gossip incoming. Hi guys, um, thanks very much for uh, having me on here today. Um, so yes, so I'm the royal journalist. Um, for the Daily Beast. I'm the Royal Correspondent for the Daily Beast, um, which is a 
uh, in America, it's a very well known um, online uh, publication, and we cover a whole range of things. And I was actually hired uh, for the Daily Beast by uh, the great Tina Brown, uh, the founding editor, who, of course, be well known to um, to, to royal fans. Um, she was and, on our, she was um, on our show part. last week. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. She was Fantastic. the warm up act for sure you. She was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no comment. <laughs> uh, um, well, Tina uh, was great, and but I suppose my interest in the um, royal family um, really uh, dates back to some kind of stories um, that uh, went the rounds in, in my family. A- an uncle of mine in the in the eighteen eighties uh, called uh, Christopher Sykes. Um, who uh, was, uh, I've, I've got the details here, so just forgive me, because my my other um, cousin, Christopher Simon Sykes, wrote this very good book um, about the Sykes family, which has got uh, some of the details in it. Um, we'll put that on, so, the, on the website. Yeah, no, and it is, it, is, it is a good book. It is a good book. So Christopher Sykes was born in 1831, and he died in 1898. Um, and he was a conservative um, politician. He sat in the House of Commons um, and uh, his signature piece of legislation in the House of Commons was um, a, uh, a law that, that, that was passed protecting seabirds. Um, and he was ridiculed in Vanity Fair as the gull's friend because of this, um, because <laughs> his his one piece of uh, of legislation that that he got that he got passed in 1869, but he became a close friend of Edward the Seventh, who was then obviously the Prince of Wales, and was of course quite a famous um, uh, hedonist, uh, shall we say, uh, Edward the Seventh, um, and was of course famously the longest serving um, Prince of Wales. Uh, waiting for uh, his uh, dear mother, Queen Victoria, to die. And Christopher um, became a very good friend of the Prince of Wales. I'm not sure exactly how he got to know him in the first place, but, you know, they were from a kind of, you know, rich family in Yorkshire. His brother was a baronet. Like, they they used to hang out in London uh, at the the Marlborough Club. They were known as the uh, the, the the Marlborough set um, by some, and <clears throat> the Marlborough House set. And the relationship kind of deteriorated, and and because Christopher was overly sort of impressed and overly overly sycophantic, really. Um, to the to to uh, the the Prince of Wales, and what happened was that um, as as they would get as they would drink in the evenings and and get drunk and and have fun, um, the king developed a habit of pouring his glass of brandy over poor old Psyche's head, and the brandy would then drip off his nose, and. Christopher would reply, as your royal highness pleases. And this became a kind of party act that um, <clears throat> that Edward would dump a, a glass of brandy over, over poor old poor old Christopher's head. And this was really only the most graphic illustration of what was going on, because behind the scenes, uh, Christopher was running up huge debts to entertain and to stay part of this kind of very exclusive club, and ultimately, it 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 would have, you know, it, it would have ruined him and led to him going bankrupt. He, he was actually bailed out at the last minute. And my grandfather, who was called Christopher Sykes as well, <laughs> um, wrote the most brilliant. A series of essays. There were four essays called Four Studies in Loyalty. So my grandfather was, um, he was a writer and he was like Evelyn Waugh's best friend. And he wrote uh, Evelyn Waugh's biography, which for many years was the kind of standard work on Evelyn Waugh. It was subsequently um, 
it was subsequently kind of displaced by uh, I think Selena Hastings um, did a yep. brilliant um, kind of biography. Um, <clears throat> but but um, Christopher, one of the first books he wrote was called Four Studies in Loyalty, and it's absolutely is there. There are four different stories in it, and one of them is the story of Psyche and the Prince of Wales, and and really that's where a lot of the information um, comes from. But I say that really by way of a, a preface to um, uh, the other um, story um, that uh, has done the rounds in, in the family o- over the years, um, which is that there was a rumour that my grandmother, who was called Camilla Russell, um, had what is often termed a romantic friendship um, with uh, King George VI, uh, obviously, uh, better known uh, to, to to most of us these days as Bertie, the stammering king from uh, the King's Speech, um, <clears throat> and they they were friends really. So Christopher, so we're on a generation now, and uh, my grandfather Christopher Sykes, who died when I was kind of twelve, I suppose, so kind of you know forty years ago. Um, and the writer and his wife Camilla Russell, um, and they they were friends really of the of the royals uh, of of the king and the queen of George the sixth and uh, the lady who of course we know better as, as the queen mother, but who they rather rudely referred to as bulging Bess. Um, <laughs> I've not heard bulging Bess. Gosh, so when <laughs> when was this friendship? When did it start? <clears throat> so. It's hard to know exactly, but I did actually, my father actually died um, 18 months ago. And uh, I did, before he died, I did get him to write some of it down, um, which, um, so so I have got um, some of it here. But um, as far as I can tell, uh, it was definitely, I think that it, it, it sort of began perhaps towards the end of the war, so in the kind of 1940s. And I think my my grandfather was away at the war. He was in the Special Forces, and he was um, behind the lines in eastern France near Metz um, for two years, living in the the woods, um, setting up an advance camp for the Americans to come through. And this is another story in, in the 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 collection for four studies in loyalty and i think that it it possibly um began then because then in 1945 um they bought the lease on a very uh lovely double fronted um house on eaton terrace um christopher and camilla uh now uh, i hasten to add that um buying a lease on a, on a house in Eaton Terrace in, in 1945 which was probably uh, the best year ever that you could have um, bought a lease because the whole of London was completely destroyed and bombed and no one had any money. Um, <clears throat> but they, presumably through a sort of, I suppose Christopher would have had a trust fund from the Sykeses and Camilla probably had a trust fund from, from the Russells, they bought uh, this um, lovely house on Eaton Terrace. It's not. I've been to look at it. It's not incredibly grand. It's. It's. You know. It's. It's. It's not one of those big pillar jobs. You know, on Eaton Square. But it's a beautiful house. And as far as I can tell, part of the reason they bought that was to entertain uh, their set, which included the king and queen. And so the the king and queen would come um, for dinner um, a couple of times a year. Um, and because of rationing, um, the only way that you could uh, really provide a dinner um, or something like that so, sort of legally um, was to get a hotel to do it and to deliver the food um, to the house, which is what they used to do. So, uh, so... My father, who was born in 1937, remembered, um, you know, looking over the balcony and seeing the king and queen arrive 
seeing uh you know uh, len the odd job man dressed up uh as a butler um for the evening then going into the the side room and having having their cocktails and 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 their drinks and and all that kind of thing and there was always this rumor that um camilla and the king uh enjoyed a bit more of a friendship um perhaps um <clears throat> are the letters they, or- one thing that they Unfortunately, I have to tell you right now, I've looked many years and there's absolutely no documentary evidence of this. There are no so letters. This, this, rumor uh, in your, this rumor in your family, Tom. Um, yeah. We, clearly, <laughs> your father would have heard it, uh, given that um, his parents were friendly, perhaps very friendly with the royal family. Um, was it sort of openly spoken of or just some slightly whispered, a slightly embarrassing, naughty secret? I mean, did, did you ever talk to Camilla think... about it? No, Camilla died when I was really quite young. She died quite young. So I would have only been seven or eight when Camilla died. Um, but, um, yeah, no, you're right. Uh, no, I don't think it was. Um, as, as far as I know, I mean, I've talked to other members of my family about it. They've said, oh, you know, yeah, it was definitely, we we heard that. Um, but they were, they, you know, they they would hang out a lot. They one of the things they they liked to do, um, the, the the king and and Camilla, um, was they liked to go to um, Victoria Palace uh, and uh, enjoy um, sort of variety shows in the music halls, uh, in the music hall at Variety Palace, and then they would go back um, to the palace and have a private dinner um, in a little octagonal dining room on on the first floor. Um, and the, one of the, the, the sort of, there's a couple of funny anecdotal stories. So one of the things that I actually do remember um, is my grandfather doing an impression of the king seducing his wife, um, which began, come and see here, my little flower, and sit upon my knee. <laughs> <laughs> I to imagine George I mean, am- doing that. Amongst the sort of circles, <laughs> um, I mean, people who live in grand houses near Eaton Square, and uh, people who are around the royal family for many generations, and in the f- subsequent to this era, it's always been understood that there were these discreet liaisons, and often the husbands looked the other way, like good old Parker Bowles looked the other way for a long time, and that was just understood. Do you think your granddad was such a man? Or was it something? Oh, I think totally. I mean, I think they both had their own things going on. Uh, I think that um, my um, my grandmother was apparently delighted when her firstborn was, was a son because it meant she didn't have to have any more children, which would have ruined her figure. Um, you know, yeah, I, th- I think it, it was a different kind of time, you know, and I'm very, I try to be very unjudgmental about it because I think that what those people went through in the Second World War is just so unimaginable. I mean, imagine going and living in a forest in France for three, two or three years, not knowing if any day was going to be your last. Imagine half of your town being destroyed and bombs sure. being rained in it. I mean, I just, so I'm very, I don't, you know, I, I think, you know, but and, and I do say, think your, also, your I think father, there's all this stuff about, your father, Tom. Yeah, well, I just, well, I just want to say one thing, which I think there's all this nonsense about, you know, has Prince William had an affair? Has he not had an affair? You know, and of course, there's always been stories about it. Well, I would like to point out that if he hasn't had an affair, he will be the first Prince of Wales in history to have never had an affair. So, you know. <laughs> well, th- this uh, is what I mean, Diana, this the side down if he didn't. Diana and Charles used to argue <laughs> about this, didn't they? But um, you've picked up stories because I mean you're very well connected in those sort of circles. I mean you've and you've written about it when uh, the press in Britain didn't write about it. But I mean you have in the Daily Beast about not just one affair with William but several. Is that, is that right? Well, there's definitely always been rumours that you know uh, William, um, you know, ha- had uh, you know had 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 had, had affairs. Um, those have always been rumours. Um, in a way, it seems to me like those rumours will never be substantiated or they'll never be stood up because it seems to me that he, the people who have been um, uh, named by some publications as as the person he's had an affair with are sort of drawn from that same aristocratic circle. Yeah. Who, but who that's how it works, of, isn't it? Um, yeah. 
yeah. and, and I think a little bit of the same thing, uh, you know, I th- obviously, um, <clears throat> if you're the king and you want to have an affair with, with somebody, you need to be reasonably uh, careful um, who you who you decide uh, to, to do that with. But um, yes, yeah, so there were only really ever. And, and I, sadly, I mean, I'd love to have written a, a book about it. And I did try and I, I did some research about it. But there's just no physical evidence you know there's no letters anything like that was destroyed but one one quite another quite funny story so sorry to drop another quite quite strong evidence in in the way your father looked he looks just like george the (laughs) sixth well no i think it i think it predates i think i think it predates i I think the relationship relationship predates the birth of my father Yeah, yeah yeah but um another quite funny story that is in the winter of 1949 um <clears throat> Christopher and Camilla were invited to a ball at Buckingham Palace. And um, so the whole of Britain was shivering with rationing and shortages and um a three-year wait for a new car, clothing coupons. Well, Buckingham Palace threw this lavish party with champagne, dishes, pheasant, partridge, you know, because you're allowed game, obviously, was exempt from the rationing from, from Sandringham. Hundreds of guests. And the, the, the rumour was that um, the king and Camilla um, did not join this uh, big celebration, but had a quiet um, dinner à deux in a, in a, in, in a, a smaller um, little, little dining room. Said to be, was, my father always insisted it was an octagonal dining room. So I don't know, I, that perhaps is one thing I could investigate. But... Christopher was chatting to the US ambassador to London, an acquaintance of his at the bar. <coughs> and a friend of the ambassador's came over and greeted him. And uh, Christopher, um, uh, the, the ambassador, turned to his friend and said, uh, this is Christopher. And then he said, Christopher, I'm so sorry. I must apologize. I've completely forgotten your last name. And Christopher is said to have replied, Colonel Keppel. Oh golly! And Keppel, of course, was <laughs> not the mistress of Edward VIII, of Seventh. But so Alice Keppel was the king the well-known mistress affair with Camilla. Are we, uh, that's that's two I know, of them. I know. Was there I know. any suggestion? And the other story any, that I love. Any, the other was there story any suggestion that, that the Queen it, Mother had romantic friendships, or was she just looking the other way while her husband did? God, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. I genuinely don't know. Anyway, the enough. last tiny anecdote i have to tell you about about this is that um my father had a a dreadful stammer uh which he inherited uh from his father um who also had 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 a stammer and um so and my father was treated um by mr logue the um speech therapist from the king's speech (laughs) because the king Said to my mother, "Oh, you must take and see this this wonderful man." Uh, you know, blah 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 blah. That's interesting. So I don't know. I mean, and and the the other funny thing is that when the king died in 1952, I mean, literally the moment that he died, they gave up the lease on the house in Eaton Terrace and moved to the country. And my father said to his mother, um, "Why are we leaving London?" She said, "Well, there's no, no point being here anymore now that the king has died." And I, I think, actually, I think it was the end of an era when um, George VI died. I think, you know, uh, Elizabeth was obviously, you know, such a brilliant monarch in so many, in so many, you know, she was the right woman at the right time for, for the job. But she definitely wasn't fun like the previous sort of generations. You know, there was no, there was, was no wildness. There was her no sister party. was quite wild. Her mm-hmm. sister was. <laughs> her sister was. Her sister was. I mean, but I, the, I think the, the so. That's that really, as far playing, as I know, that's when the association kind of kind of ended. Um, the they were both invited to the in my funeral. Mind when we talk about these scandalous, gossipy things, which let's face it, are fun, especially if it's in your own family. But the question is, yeah, should does it matter? Should we care if the people at the top of our society are secretly having affairs? Why the hell not? I mean. Or Everyone should we know is. because they represent something bigger than themselves, the nation or the church? Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing, isn't it? I think when DNA testing came in, I think it was a bit of a shocker for people to realise um, 
how many people discovered that, you know, they had secret brothers or secret sisters or their fathers weren't their father, their mother, you know. So I, th I think, uh, but I, I, you know, the, the royals have to, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I think what's so, um, you know, I love the story as well. And you must have had Georgie Campbell on. You should get, if you haven't, you should get her on. Yes, we have. About yes, we her. have people who talked about Camilla Sykes being, being, a, being a lover. Yes, yes, yes. Well, and she also presumably told you her amazing, um, the, well, it's not her theory, but the amazing theory that she did a lot to, 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 to popularise about the Queen Mother um, being the cook's daughter. Did you yes. tell you that one? That's been widely yeah, reported just, now. Such an amazing, fantastic story. And, you know, at the same time, obviously very practical. I mean, if you've had nine female children in a row or whatever it was they had, and you're going to lose the house, I mean, you're compelled, really, to, you know, try and try, try and save the try and save the place. So I don't know. I mean, look, I sort this is the, of also wonder. I've got to say, we should explain to the listeners, this is a story that the Queen Mother basically used a surrogate, the cook, to have um, the child, to have the queen, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't that the story? Yeah. And that's yeah. why she was Who subsequently, cooking. yeah, better known. And, as... <laughs> and, and, and the queen's sort of the second name was Marguerite, which is the name of the cook, which is not a royal name. Um, I think the problem with that theory it. is that the the, the 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 well, no, not one of the problems. I think the the one of the interesting things is that the, the, the queen mom was seen at a dance shortly before she supposedly had the child. And no, and no one felt that she was pregnant. At the wrong end of the country. At the wrong yeah. end of the country as well. So we see certain parallels, because that's, of course, one of the accusations with Meghan, isn't it? That she's used a surrogate to have Archie. Mm. Mm. I, I mean, that mm. brings us slightly Although, onto... I never your... really understood that one. No, no I, I didn't it. But that brings us slightly on to the, you know, you, you've got this very interesting foot in sort of both sides of the Atlantic. You're writing for an American audience. You're based in Britain. You clearly have very good connections in Britain, which is, I think, used to inform your journalism. I mean, do you find that that, I mean, that you find that there are two very different views of the royals on each side of the Atlantic, or is that, are they increasingly coming together into a common view? I think it's really hard to tell. I think it's just, I think, I think everything is so polarized now. Um, that, that I think that if you spend too much time trying to think about what people think, uh, it's a really dangerous trap to go down. And I think as a writer or reporter or journalist, uh, you just have to do the best with the sources that you have and people who speak to you um, to tell um, the truth um, as you understand it. But I do think that um, I think there will always be a fascination with Harry and Meghan. And I think people will always, you know, I think they could at any point, I think they could click their fingers and get a million dollars to go and do an after dinner speech. I mean, I really do. Um, so I think that the idea that they're sort of washed up um, can be a bit very much oversold, you know. Um, I think, I think perhaps what I, do think is true is that I think in America uh people sort of they they're a lot more I don't know they they can sort of turn on you quite quickly in America and it's not really turning on you they just grow bored of you and there's so much there's so many people competing for Americans entertainment uh for, for Americans attention um that I think that um I think they need to be careful, um, Harry and Meghan. And I think that, you know, I think they probably, uh, I think they were very unlucky with their timing. Um, literally, COVID happened, you know, right after they left. And I think if COVID hadn't happened, they might have been able to give their independent careers a bit, a bit more of a kickstart. As it was, they were kind of becalmed for a couple of years. Then they did this interview with Oprah, which, you know, whilst it was big news at the time, I think ultimately, I think people wanted to hear it and they wanted to hear it once. I don't think they needed to hear it all again in mm. Harry's book. And, I, you know, I think people don't, it's hard to listen to somebody just complaining the whole time, isn't it? I mean, we all have friends like that who just moan and moan and moan and moan about everything. 
And in the end, you're just like, do you know what? I actually don't want to spend, <laughs> I don't want to spend any time with you. So but what's the bigger the problem same, yeah. for the monarchy, the Meghan or Andrew? I weirdly, I don't think, I, I sort of, <laughs> in a way, neither of them are a problem because they've managed to sort of cut themselves free of them. I, I, there is consternation, as I understand it, amongst some people of why have they made this very public show of support to Andrew and bringing Andrew back into the fold when it appeared they had quite successfully cut him off. And people tell you can only really tell you that it's because <clears throat> Charles believes in unity, um, more um, perhaps more um, uh, unguarded um, people might tell you off the record that they'd rather have the troublemakers inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's a bit of truth to that. Um, but ultimately, I don't think Harry and Meghan are really a problem. I mean, I think, you know, they dropped the last truth bomb, right? Which was that it was Charles and Kate, who, or the last truth bomb was accidentally dropped on their behalf. But it was Charles and Kate who were the royal racists. And what was the response? Charles, you know, they got a, Kate got a standing ovation at the Royal Albert Hall that evening. So I, I think they, um, I, I think, I think they fluffed it. I think they took a shot. You know, it's not saying if you take a shot at the king, you better kill him. Well, they took a shot at the king and they really did not. It looked for a moment like it it was really going to damage um, the royals. But actually, I'm I'm kind of amazed that it, that it didn't, that it just, that people really turned against Harry and Meghan. But and I they think that... Other um, shots in the, in the, that they can use? I mean, isn't that, are there rumours that she may do a book? I think there are, but I mean, I just, I don't know. I mean, I suppose she might have to if she needs the money, but I just, I just wonder whether people in America are just going to go roll their eyes and go, we're tired of your bullshit. You know, I, I don't know. I just, that, that's slightly the feeling I get. I think it'd be a big risk to do another really negative tell all book. Gosh, and how myself, about Fergie? Especially yeah. if they, Is Fergie if they just want this career as from... TV producers and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I what was that, Andrew? Distancing herself from from Andrew because I mean, she, her 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 money is made in the states, and this can't be good for her brand. I mean, that's what you would think, right? But she seems to take every opportunity she can to really associate herself with Andrew. So she's she's a clever, you know. She, I I do think there is a really different level of respect and love for Fergie in America than there is in the UK. And I think we're warming to her a bit now in the UK. I think people are coming around to it and they're thinking, for God's sake, it was 20 years, 30 years ago, whatever, you know, and she's, you know, she's she's done her best and the world's changed and the world's moved on. And I, I think the, the late queen was, you know, very important in, in helping that rehabilitation. But um, I don't know, like, it, it's it's a funny one, isn't it? Because you would have thought that logically... Yeah, she wouldn't want anything. I would. I don't understand why anyone wants to. Why? Who wants to walk to church, with Prince yes. Andrew, on Christmas morning? I. I don't get it. I yeah. don't get it. And and there are, you know, there are people. I mean, someone was was telling me this week that that Williams, you know, not particularly happy with the overall strategy, you know, but that you know he accepts he accepts the authority of his father and you know has to go along with it. And the last thing he's going to do is kick up a big another feud or a big another load of trouble but I, I think I think really if it with hindsight I, I think you'd you'd have to say maybe it might have been better to leave Andrew in the shadows I don't understand really what the advantage was in in making him a what do you think Andrew because I know you're writing about Andrew I mean why I, I think why they would bring try... him in from the car they were well. I think it, you know, as you say, they want to have the person inside the tent rather than outside. I think it's it's about family unity. Um, uh, you know, you, they've got enough problems. Try and keep everyone on side if they can. Uh, I think, as you say, there's a sense of forgiveness. There's, I mean, after all, the, the king had made a speech about the importance of family and forgiveness. And he could hardly keep people out. 
But Andrew had been at Sandringham the previous year and just hadn't gone to church, so they could have easily done that. Mm. I think they weren't, I don't think they realised what was in these depositions. Uh, they, I think they believed mm. things he had said. Uh, and now, of course, he's been caught out. That there's, there's far more there than I think he realised would come out. And so their strategy, they've been caught. But actually, by... actually, Andrew, do you know what? I, I disagree with you on that. I, I, there's nothing new. There's nothing new in those depositions. There's not one new thing in them. There's the thing uh, that, because I, I actually did a, did, did some research on this for a story I was doing this weekend. So I just double checked everything. The only thing that I thought might be new was this idea that, that Virginia Dufre had been paid $15,000 by Andrew. That was out there, 2020. Someone had written about that. The idea that he, you know, had participated in a teenage orgy or that he had sex with Virginia Dufre. Well, I mean, that's well out there. I, I mean, I agree, like, you know, at, at the same time, it's not a great week. For Prince uh, Andrew, but I think actually, it's all, there's no fr there's no new allegation in there. There is not well, one new fact, allegation. He's there. spent several weeks in Miami. I think the thing is, we've uh, we now have a much stronger right. sense of what was going on at the, at, the, at the Epstein Mansion, and he was spending a lot of time there. Uh, but I think the yeah. importance okay. is we're getting yeah. legal depositions. You know, we've heard these stories; people have written or had interviews, but we've not had them give uh, depositions under oath. And I think we've got several people yeah. talking. So I think it is, it, it, the picture has come together. Uh, we were getting little fragments before and suddenly we're seeing the full picture and, yeah. and on the yeah, basis of legal enough. depositions. Uh, and certainly my research yeah. is pushing, pulling up quite a lot of other stuff. Um, uh, you know, yeah. he's been caught lying repeatedly, covering his tracks, making trips there when he claimed to be doing other things. And so if he's lying about mm. that, one wonders if he's lying about other things. And I think... The worry must be that the people now feel, now these depositions have come out um, that other people might be, come forward. I'm certainly uh, talking to a number of people who don't necessarily have had had, had affairs with him or, or, or slept with him, but their friends did, and they're speaking on behalf of the friends. Now, of course, that's second-hand information, but there's no reason for these mm. people to make it up um, when when someone has come to them and, and it's all sort of slightly off the record. So I don't know. I think I think I think you're absolutely right that it pulls it all together. That it's you're right that it it pulls it all together and it it puts it all in context. And it's like all these little bits of the mosaic have suddenly been put together in one sort of huge, you know, huge masterpiece. Yeah, we had a sort of drip, <laughs> stretched drip across the effect. canvas, and people sort of forgot. Yeah. You know, I, I've just even going through yeah. the cuts. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of stories that I'd forgotten about, and I think suddenly we've got all this stuff together. But I think that's that's what happened. I didn't. I don't think he'd been totally open with them, uh, and now they've sort of had a mm. panic uh, about what's going to happen. Mm. But do you find there's a yeah, sort of tension yeah. because I mean you have very good contacts and you protect your sources. Um, I mean, do they speak to you because they sort of feel the story needs to get out? Or do they speak on behalf of other people that, that you, you feel sometimes you might be used? Um, wh why should people talk? Because as you say, there is this very strong amerta around the royal family. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's it, it, it's complicated. But I mean, ultimately, it, it comes down to trust, I suppose. Um, and But yeah, you, you're always aware that people are you know, potentially trying to use you to, to get their narrative over. And, and it is, I suppose it's your job as a journalist to filter those out, you know, for your, for your, for your readers and to, you, you have to, ultimately you have to make a decision about whether, whether you trust your sources or not. Um, I, I don't know. But why do they talk in really the first place? It. I mean, what's in it for them? Is it well, just uh, or, or getting the truth out? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm not really massively comfortable talking about the motivations of of you know people who speak to me in confidence, really. Okay, no, fair enough, fair enough. But I mean, I want, I want to go back to your own family because all this is fascinating talking about Andrew and Fergie <laughs> and the rest of it. But, but your I'm father, say, is I'm disappointed. More... I, I was going to call you sir or your majesty. I, I thought your dad definitely looked like a royal, but you're saying it's impossible. <laughs> is it the Harry and James Hewitt thing? The dates just don't match. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, it's a bit of that. It's a bit of that. Yeah, it's a bit of that film. Oh, but, I don't know. But, um, I think you're covering up an even deeper, darker secret. That's what I think. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it's such a... 
but my dad was my dad was yes he was he was he was he was he was, he was, he was not uh, he, he he he'd be unlikely to, to to win father of the year um but he was a good he was a good uh he, he was good company uh and a great um great raconteur and that kind of thing and um yeah, I was just very lucky. So he actually, funnily enough, speaking about Georgie earlier, um, he actually sent Georgie uh, three or four checks because he was very good friends. Georgie was really his his best friend, and she was amazing to him. Uh, We're talking about Lady my, Colin um, Campbell here. But people who don't yes, know, Georgie Lady Colin Campbell. Lady after, Colin Campbell, just, you know, yes, strange yes. British after, upper class codes are being used. Yeah. We should provide a glossary for our American and Australian. <laughs> Lady C. Lady C was amazing and just publicly, you know, say a big thank you to her because she was um she was fantastic to my father and she she really uh she 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 would have him down every weekend after my stepmother died. Uh he spent every weekend there. And so he sent her the uh these chapters of the memoir, which she then sent to me um after after he died. Um, which is how I know a lot of this stuff. So, um, you know, it's great. I mean, I knew it. I knew it, it on background. But there's there's another brilliant story, which sadly he didn't write down, which was um, the this, this story of when he was sick on the king's shoes, which was one of his favourite stories. Um, <laughs> I think they, like, had been invited to Sandringham shooting or something. Or maybe the king had come to Sledmere to shoot. I don't know. Anyway, they... The kids were lined up to 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 meet the king. He said, I'm, I'm, "I'm really, I'm really not feeling well. Don't be ridiculous. You have to come meet the, you know, you have to come be presented to the king. I'm really not feeling. I'm really not feeling too good. Don't be ridiculous. You know, Bella was marched out and promptly vomited on the king's shoes. And apparently, the king was very charming. He said, "Don't, don't worry about it." Gosh. And you don't feel any <laughs> deep kind of DNA. Uh, ancestral <laughs> drives pulling you towards a man who might pour brandy on your head or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad to say I don't. No, no, no. But well, your about your it's, it's, it's a wonderful way to sort of see the, the royals and how they really live in private and the, perhaps their secret sense of fun and naughtiness. That's that's why it's so interesting, I think, to, to get yes. that, yeah. that angle. It, and you get it only from diaries yeah. and things like Noel Coward and people like that, who, who clearly were very mm, close. Because, mm, I mean, your mm, father, I mean, he mm, went to mm, prison. I mean, he had lots of wives. He had lots of different careers. I mean, he, he was a, quite a quite a character. Can you sort of give us a quick portrait of him? He, uh, well, he, Times you of know, victory he, up, up on, the, on the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was sort of a work of art, that obituary, definitely. Um, yeah, he... Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think again. I think a lot of it is the legacy of of the war. I really do, and I think that I think that we do actually forget um, if you were born in 1937, quite how miserable and terrifying um, your your childhood was. I mean, even if you were, you know, a member of the so called upper classes or whatever, you know, you you were always hungry um there there was never there was never enough to eat and you know everybody was coming home you know if they were coming home at all missing an arm missing a leg you know all these kinds of things and so i i do think that after the war you definitely see you know that that there is this obviously the eldest sons and what have you keep inheriting their estates and you know, nothing changes um, behind the walls of those bigger states. But I think you definitely see this other kind of um, almost subculture of the aristocracy, you know, which really, really epitomized by, by people like, like my father, who thought, you know, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a fun and I'm going to have a laugh and I'm going to, and the other thing that's really weird when, when you read the newspapers from, from those days is that they only, the only people that they, the people that they wrote about were aristocrats. I mean, when you read the Daily Express gossip column from, you know, 1958, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's, it's all these sort, sort of minor aristocrats. So my dad became, um, my, my dad was, he, he, uh, he, he was, he was a leader of this thing called the Chelsea set. Um, in the kind of late 50s, early 60s. 
and they were kind of you know bright young aristocratic things you know who who messed around in London there was a lot of kind of gambling clubs I mean the Aspinall sort of gambling fortune sort of sprung out of that same era so it was a lot of illegal gambling clubs and um yeah you know it, it was it, it it was it was a it was a wild time I mean you know one of my um <laughs> one of my father's friends who I, I said I was um I was interviewing and I, I said I wanted to I was going to write a book he said but I am I really don't think you should um I really don't think you should write a book about it. And I said, really, why not? He said, well, people might misunderstand. You know, it was it was a very different time. And I said, well, what do you mean it was a different? I know it was a different time. What do you mean? He said, well, you see, if I was if I was going to meet a friend at the Drones Club, you see, say, for example, you know, and I was late, I'd run out onto the road and a bus would be coming down and I'd hop onto the bus and I'd say, Oh, driver, um, you seem to have a um, flat tyre at the back. Um, and he'd go, oh, thanks very much, Governor. And he'd jump off the bus and he'd run around and have a look um, to, to have a look at the tyre. And while he was out of the bus, I'd jump into the driver's seat and I'd just drive myself to the Jones Club. And the driver would be running along behind the bus, screaming and shouting. <laughs> and I'd park outside the Ritz and I'd run into the Ritz um, <laughs> because I knew that the bus driver wouldn't be able to follow me in there. And I would say... Right. OK. And he said and he looked at me and he said, you know, if you did that today, you would be shot. You <laughs> would be shot. And it, it really for me, it really summed up. You know, it's such it's a lovely anecdote, obviously, but it's it's just how very incredibly sort of in a way unaccountable you were, how anonymous you were. There was God, I mean, you know, there was absolutely no it was barely even I mean, a check. You know, you could just write a check and just sign it and get. Because did know, they walk have out of the hotel? You'd been trust, trust funds. I mean, did they need to work, or was this a generation that just lived? My off? father didn't. Yeah, my didn't father did not. No, no. So no, he had no. to earn. I, his I living. think. I think his far. Yeah. So he had to earn his living because Christopher was, you know, a younger son, and so I think Christopher was his father was provided for by by the sort of Sledmere estate to 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 a certain extent. I mean, I think he would have considered himself dreadfully poor. Um, and we would have thought that probably having a house on Eaton Terrace would mean you're doing all right. <laughs> wow, what a world. <laughs> but a but world. my father certainly wouldn't have. My father certainly had to make his own money. And yes, yeah, so he, he he kind of he ran gambling clubs for a lot of time. Then he got mixed up in in various um uh sorts of uh, uh criminal enterprises. He never actually uh, just to 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 defend my father for a moment, he never actually spent time um in prison other than on remand. Um right. so he was remanded Sorry. uh in custody correct. and he and he was deported um to he was deported uh, to Australia. But he beat the case in Australia and was acquitted and returned home with his uh, reputation and and, uh, and and record um intact. So uh, oh, good. I apologize for that. I think that was in the Times, so I misread it. <laughs> no, it, it's it's true. He 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 spent time in prison, but he was on, on remand. Gosh. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. I yeah, think we have yeah, to wrap yeah, this up, yeah, Andrew. But you know, it was it was a big there's show. there's actually there's actually a lovely um there's actually and and Christopher, you know, my, his father obviously, like any father, adored his son. And 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 there's a lovely bit in in a letter from, I think from Nancy Mitford, who was a friend of Christopher's and wrote Noblesse. He contributed to the Noblesse Oblige volume because it yep. was that originally that pamphlet was published as a larger volume, and Christopher wrote one of the essays. And there's a lovely letter where. Nancy, I think, writes to Evelyn Waugh and says um, something like, I saw Christopher at the club in London and he was terribly sad and uh, I couldn't get much out of him. But of course, it's something to do with that son who he so adores, you know, and you're just like, yeah, you know. So I think I think it was, you know, I'm. I'm probably uh, I, I'm probably inclined to um, I'm probably inclined to um, uh, give my dad the benefit of the, the mitigating circumstances. I think it was a strange time in British society. Um, 
and I think that um yeah I think I think that I think that the whole world was readjusting after the second world war I really do I think I think the whole world was, and then of course you know in the 60s and it washed it all away really so gosh well, I we, think was... we all need to f- start flagging down buses and t- telling the driver <laughs> yeah to see how far we go we've Actually, come long that story, before you get shot the, my sympathies with the bus driver uh, thank you so much tom <laughs> for sharing this amazing um very different take on a uh, 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 scandalous but fun time <laughs> great thanks <laughs> so thanks, much no, thanks, 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 we've covered a lot of ground Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a Podcast World production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio.